Thank you very much, thank you very much. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we uh, in the lab have been doing, but also what some of the exciting things in the field of, of gerontology. And first I start by saying that the medical field is really turned into a band-aid field, right? So we wait until somebody develops cancer and then we use chemotherapy or other therapies that you know, do some good but also you know, kill cancer cells but also kill the normal cells. Or, or with Alzheimer's, we wait until somebody's brain is, is very damaged beyond the repair and then we do as, you know, we put a band-aid on it essentially and try to keep the person from progressing further in their dementia, but it doesn't really do much good. But even if we were able to be very successful in, uh, in curing some of these diseases, I always ask this question and guess what would be how much longer we would live if we were good enough to completely cure cancer. What do you think? 20 years? 25 years? It actually turns out that it's only about three to four years, right? And, and what if we were uh, good enough to cure cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes today? And the answer is, is about 13 years. And the reason for this is that if one disease doesn't get you, something else will. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, and this is why instead, if we, uh, you know, in the, in the aging field, we're really saying, well, why does a mouse get a cancer after one and a half years of life and people never get cancer when they're one and a, year, one and a half years old, right? Well, uh, we get it after 40, after 50, after 60. And the reason for that, that the mouse and the people, and we age at a different rate, right? So the one and a half years for the mouse is equivalent to the 40 years for people. So if we were able to delay aging, just add health as effectively, effectively as we've already done for mice, we would then get about 30 years of extended life. So treat aging, and, and most people say, well, you know, if you're gonna treat aging, uh, we're gonna have all these people that are gonna live longer, we're gonna have Alzheimer's, we're gonna have all, all these bad diseases, so what's the point? Um, but it turns out that if you look at you know, some of our work and work of others, and these on the right are the uh, long-lived organisms. Uh, the, the first one on the left there is yeast, you have a normal lived one and the dwarf one lives up to uh, 10 times longer than the, than the one on the left. And the, the flies in the center, same thing, the, the small ones live about twice as much. And the mice, finally, the small one live uh, about 40, 50% longer. But what's amazing about these mice is that they get diseases at a lot lower incidence compared to the regular mice. And the only difference is a mutation, a single mutation in the growth hormone receptor, right? So the little mice are lacking this growth hormone receptor. So uh, years ago, uh, we knew that this simple organism, the yeast, lived longer, was very healthy, their DNA was very much protected, and we knew that the mice also had this record longevity, but even though they lived longer, they 50% of them never develop any diseases compared to the regular mice, uh, that only about 10% of, of them or less never develop diseases. So we started, we looked for people around the world that had the same mutation and asked the question, is it possible that people uh, can also be so protected uh, against uh, aging, but also against the age-related diseases? And it turns out that they seem to be so. I started a collaboration with Jaime Guevara, who's an endocrinologist who was following all these people down in Ecuador. And particularly in the mountains, in the Andes Mountains, in the southern Ecuador, we were able to follow very closely about 100 of these subjects. And it turns out that they almost never uh, develop cancer. And in fact, only one in all these years that have been monitored in over 30 years, only one of them have, has died of cancer. And you can see instead in the relatives, you have what you expect about 22% incidence of cancer deaths. And then when we look at diabetes, um, even though in Ecuador, the obesity prevalence is about 12%, and these people, these little people, have a prevalence of diabetes, which, of obesity, which is much higher, over 20%. And so any under endocrinologist or diabetologist will tell you these people for sure are gonna have diabetes, and instead, it turns out that uh, even though instead of the 5% prevalence, so five out of 100 people in Ecuador have diabetes, and in their case, so far, in the case of these uh, little people, none of them has developed diabetes yet. So they're very much uh, protected, but 
the field, particularly starting in the 90s, we were all confused about how do you stay young, you know? So how do you find out about aging and how do you regulate aging? If you look around the world and you ask, uh, <laughs> uh, you ask uh, people that are, have record longevity, this, this was the oldest lady in the world at the time, living in Los Angeles, and, you know, and she felt that uh, by not drinking and fooling around, that was her, her, uh, uh, that's how she got to be 115 years of age. And uh, I'm embarrassed to say, in the next slide, uh, actually Salvatore Caruso in southern Italy agrees with her, and, uh, and so he came up with no wine, no smoking, and no women as a motto uh, for longevity. <laughs> but uh, uh, of course he, he didn't. <laughs> But uh, Madame Calmont of France obviously uh, disagrees, uh, and, uh, and not only she disagreed, but she got the record, right? She made it to 122 years and a half of age, and now you're saying, okay, this shows that you can do whatever you want. Wrong, right? <laughs> uh, and in fact, I just visited the, the, since yesterday, the oldest woman in the world is, a, is a, an Italian lady, Emma Morano, and, you know, and everybody said, well, you know, she eats three eggs a day and steaks, et cetera, et cetera. But then when you look deeper, it turns out that a lot of people in her family live to 100, 102, 103. And that tells you it's so difficult to make it to 100. And that tells you there's genetic, uh, the genetic makeup of these families is such that they're much, much more likely, potentially hundreds of fold more likely than everybody else to make it to such an old age. And this is why they can sometimes do whatever they want. Like in her case, you know, smoking to 117 years of age. And by the way, she quit smoking, not because of health reason, obviously, but because she was embarrassed that she couldn't light up anymore. And that was her, uh, <laughs> a reason for her smoking. You know, a lot of us in the field, mostly 20 years ago or longer, we started saying, well, we can never figure out how people age because it's too complicated. So let's just turn into very simple systems, right? And some of us turn to the, the bacteria, the unicellular uh, baker's yeast, what's used to make bread and, and wine. And some people study the worms. But you know, something that I first had described many years ago was if you starve these organisms, you, you switch them from, from a lot of nutrients to water, they live longer, right? So it's very counterintuitive. You think you starve them to death. But no, not only did they starve, they live longer. And they were very protected. So and, and there was a very uh, surprising finding that I had made back in the days at UCLA. And now, you know, decades later, we actually have, you know, don't worry about the details here, but we, uh, we now have a network. We understand that why fasting works, right? So particularly fasting works because amino acids uh, in the proteins in the diet activate one pathway, which is called TOR pathway, and another one is called growth hormone IGF-1. And then sugars in the, in the, in the, in the food activate a second pro-aging pathway, a, a pathway they, acti uh, they accelerate the aging process called PKA, right? So, uh, and the other surprising thing that we were uh, wishfully thinking for um, was that this is concern, concern from simple organisms all the way to humans. It turns out that it probably is. The focus of my talk, you know, so we now clearly know that these pathways, these genes, these set of genes can protect and make uh, all kinds of organisms live longer. But something that in fasting can have a major contribution or orchestrate these genes, but something that happened in one of the experiments in my lab that Chao Wei Cheng was doing, which was we fasted mice, and when you fast the mice, they become very protected against chemotherapy and all kinds of different toxins. But chemotherapy is one of the, the ones we're using now. We're running a lot of clinical trials on this. But the more surprising thing was that um, even though the mice were protected from chemotherapy, after six cycles of fasting and chemotherapy, only in the mice that were fasted, uh, for, for the six cycles, the white blood cell number went back to normal. And so that was very strange. And we said, you know, this is not possible by protection. How can, how can they just go back to normal? And so we started thinking about regeneration. Is it possible that fasting is telling the body, okay, now I want to make new cells. I want to regenerate the immune system. And so I started thinking, well, you know, maybe the body has everything in it to fix itself, right, and to regenerate and rejuvenate itself. So I started thinking about, you know, how does a couple of 40-year-olds generate a perfect baby, a zero-year-old baby, right? And then, if you think about it, you have old sperm and an old egg, right? And they get together <laughs> in the same body, and then all of a sudden, it's just perfect, right? 
So then the body knows how to do it. We just, we don't know how to uh, make the body do it. So is it possible that fasting is one of the ways that to push the body to do exactly that, go into this uh, regenerative, rejuvenating mode? And evidence for that comes from the mice. We, when we took mice and started in middle age, we gave them this what we call fasting mimicking diet. Now that we know how each ingredient uh, orchestrates the, this, all this genetic network, we can play with the diet to make the mice think, and people, as, as you'll see in a second, think that they're fasting, right? And so with this diet, we start in middle age, and then we feed it to the mice twice a month for four days. And then we return them to the, to the regular diet. And it turns out, that uh, you see the level of white blood cells in the young mice is very high, and then in the old mice it goes to a very low level, and then in the far right you see the old mice that have been on this periodic fasting mimicking diet. So now the, the level of white blood cells is back to the youthful level that they had at uh, uh, four months of age. And uh, you know, so the, you know about the connection between the immune system and cancer, and, and so one of the things you, you will expect if the immune system is getting stronger, as I just showed you, and rejuvenated, is tumors, the level of tumors goes down, and actually goes down dramatically. So the mice that have been on the diet periodically have about half of the tumors, but these tumors also occur later, and you see there on the right, the red dots are the, from the mice that were on the fasting mimicking diet and the gray dots are on the mice that are on the regular diet. So a lot less cancer later in life, and a lot of the tumors are benign in nature instead of the malignant ones that are developed by, by the mice on the regular diet. Okay, so uh, regeneration from within. And so how does it happen? And so you know, I'll just summarize it very quickly, but what happens in these mice is that you have these genes that I just already told you about, IGF-1 and PKA, and these, and these genes basically keep the stem cells in a stalled mode, right? And the immune cells, you have a high level of immune cells, but a lot of these cells are damaged. In fact, you know, this explains a lot of the autoimmunities that people have, right? So this, they're not necessarily functional or, or functioning well, especially in older people. So when, when the mice or people fast, now the stem cells, these IGF-1 and PKA genes are reducing levels, and now the stem cells are, are activated, these hematopoietic stem cells. So the stem cells of the blood are activated, and actually the immune cell level goes down, right? So the, the patient or the mouse is temporarily immunosuppressed, right? And then uh, the, the trick happens when you refeed now the stem cells that were activated during the fasting, they, they go to work and they start regenerating new immune cells. So in the mouse, it's, it's really uh, dramatic because the, immune, the level of immune cells goes down to about health and then back to the normal level. So within days, you, the mice are able to regenerate half of their immune system. And the result of that is what we call longevity extension. So these mice are now living longer, particularly when you look at the average survival. Okay, so what about people? Can we do this is in mice, but can this be transferred to people? And most people think that we can go maybe 10 days uh, without food. It turns out that most people, most of you, can go for 60 days, right? You can be with no food at all for two months, right? And actually, like the emperor penguins from, from the South Pole, some people can actually go for six months with no food at all. Right? We completely forgot this. It used to be very common in all kinds of religions, and now slowly is uh, disappearing from all religions. What happens during fasting, uh, the, uh, the body, first of all, turns from a, a glucose, a sugar burning mode, into a fat burning mode. So, and then you see there, that those are the ketone bodies, beta hydroxybutyrate, the blue line that is building up. So after just a couple of days on this fasting, your body completely reprograms. And even your brain that for most of you, all your life is being fueled by sugar, is now moving to a fat-based metabolism, right? This is why people get usually a headache after they, they, they fast for the first time. And so we uh, develop again, we had the mouse fasting mimicking diet, so we developed the human fasting mimicking diet. And again, the point of this is to trick the body into thinking it's completely, it's fasting like in a water only fast. And so we tested this in a group of, of 100 subjects at USC, and these people were asked to go on uh, uh, three cycles of this fasting mimicking diet uh, that has between 800 and 1100 calories per day, and the diet lasts for five days, so they were asked to do three of these. So in three months, essentially, they did 15 days of this fasting-making diet. 
And the results, I think, are, are again in agreement with regeneration and rejuvenation, although it's, it, we can't prove it in, in, in humans yet. But for example, if you see blood glucose, the, in the normal people that had uh, normal fasting glucose, it dropped just a little bit after these three cycles of the diet, but in pre-diabetic, it dropped a lot, right? So it went from 104 or so to 92, back to the normal level. And if you look at IGF-1, one of the, the key uh, markers, risk factor for cancer, uh, people that had normal level uh, of IGF-1 to begin with, there was a small drop, but people that had they were at risk for cancer, they had very high levels, it dropped a lot more. And the same thing also for one of the major risk factors for cardiovascular diseases, C-reactive protein this is an inflammatory marker, and so people that have high levels of this marker are at risk for, to develop cardiovascular diseases. And you see that there is no change for the people that had good levels of it from the beginning, and, and a big change for people that had very high levels of it. The circulating stem cells in the normal diet, the stem cell in the body of the patients, was, uh, the stem cell level was low, and then when you fast them, it goes uh, way up. Uh, you know, what happens in life because of diet, aging, toxin, etc., we uh, accumulate damage, and this damage can lead to all kinds of diseases. And the fasting mimicking diet, I think, switches the clock back a little bit by promoting this regeneration, rejuvenation effect. And now we're seeing effects that are consistent with protection against uh, uh, all kinds of diseases, including diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and Alzheimer's. So to summarize, I, I use my, my mentor at UCLA, uh, Roy Walford, and Roy was one of the pioneers of calorie restriction. Uh, he, uh, back in 1990, I think it was, had the bad idea to lock himself up with another seven people in a place in Arizona called Biosphere 2. And so eight of them went inside of this place, and then, Inside of this place, they became color restricted. And you know, when they were color restricted, this is what they looked like. And so this is very extreme, right? They went to this very extreme uh, color restricted diet. But the point I'm, I'm trying to make is about organs. You know, if you look at Roy Walford in the middle while he was in, in the biosphere too, his organs had shrunk to very small levels. Like for example, his liver was probably about half of the normal size. So half of the size that it was before he entered Biosphere 2 on the left, right? And then he exits Biosphere 2. And by the way, I was there when they came out and they're a very stressed out group of people. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but you see now that's wall for six months after he exited Biosphere, he went back to the same weight and the, and the organs, whether it's the muscle, the heart, <coughs> the lungs, all, all the different systems are now regenerated back to the normal size, right? And there is really not many other ways to do that but to turn on stem cells and regenerate very much in the same way that uh, the baby, the um, zygote and the uh, blastocyst and the, uh, the cells during embryogenesis are forming the embryos, right? So we think that that's probably the most powerful way to get this coordinated response, regenerating multiple systems back to a more youthful state. And I just want to end with uh, my last slide and with uh, Salvatore Caruso, who, by the way, was married and had children. So this idea about the woman, maybe it was a little bit made up. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, it, but I, uh, I think, you know, uh, the diet helped him a lot, but also a, a big uh, factor, I think, for Salvatore was he wanted to live. You know, he, he wanted to have the record. And he was always looking around the world like, who's older than me? You know, <laughs> how, how many years, how many years I, I have to live to make it there? So that was great. And I'm just going to end with this song. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>